Hello, everyone. Welcome to the very first social medicine course podcast from the Albert Einstein College of Medicine up in the Bronx in New York City. My name is Brett Wilson Stofko, and I'm one of the lead organizers of the social medicine course. The social medicine course is a student run lecture series that was founded in 1996. The course focuses on social factors such as economics, politics, and racial components that contribute to health disparities in communities throughout the world. For our opening talk this year, of the spring of 2014, we have Robert E. Fullalove, Associate Dean for Community and Minority Affairs and Professor of Sociomedical Sciences at Columbia's Mailman School of Public Health. Today, he will be speaking on HIV, mass incarceration, and health disparities in New York City. So without further ado, Bob Fullalove. giving some form of this lecture or other since the beginning of this series. Sort of a way of saying that uh, I'm an old guy, I've been around for a while. In 1986, at the University of California, San Francisco, Mindy Fulilove and I started doing HIV AIDS research. As one of the classic exemplars of uh, health disparities, HIV AIDS has grown over the years to be one of the prime ways in which we get to understand how community, social, and personal dynamics create a healthcare nightmare that uh, many of you are going to be living with, especially if you are uh, fortunate enough or unfortunate enough to stay in New York City. Part of what I like to do in talks like this is give folk a sense of history, because it's one of the things that is most lacking, I think, for modern American education. You all have grown up in a system where, for the most part, you are so aware of what's going on now, your iPhones, your computers, your connections to the web give you such a stream of data about what's happening in this moment that it is completely natural that most of your thinking is directed towards the future. And for many of you, history began the day you were born, anything the day before is kind of an abstraction. I, on the other hand, you know, like, probably is the case with most of your parents and grandparents, have that uh, vision that comes with old age where you're as clear about what comes through 2020 hindsight as you are trying to crystal ball gaze into the future. So when I talk about uh, historical developments, it's because I've been around for a long enough period of time to see dramatic shifts in medicine in particular and in the field of public health as well. And as a, professor and dean of the School of Public Health, I'm very interested in showing how those two things combine and how much the history of the last couple of decades has created our view of health disparities. The view that you see in the literature, the view that you see espoused in many of the political policies that we put together. And it's also driving much of the research agenda that many of you will undertake if you go into academic medicine as part of your careers as physicians. So, one of the things I'm also aware of the fact is that as a doctorate in education, it is always difficult to have a conversation with medical students. One of the things that I learned early on in attempting to give a version of this lecture to medical students at Columbia and the College of Physicians and Surgeons was, for most of you, what really counts is what happens when a physician tells you about real world outside medical school. But you get a real sense of what it's like to be a practicing physician in the real world, not on TV. So most of what you're tuned to pay attention to are the things that give you some capacity to anticipate what your life is going to be like in a couple of years. And while it's always interesting to have a researcher who circles around medicine talk to you about what he or she does, it doesn't have the same immediacy. It doesn't have the same impact. It doesn't have the same force as a doc telling you, you know what you're going to see in the next couple of years? And then all of a sudden, really all ears. So knowing that I, at least ostensibly, come from another culture, let me anchor myself in your culture. I am Robert Elliot Fully Love III, and I come from a long line of guys. My grandfather, Robert E. Fully Love Sr., was the son of a slave who apprenticed to a white, white uh, physician in Tupelo, Mississippi in 1894 and started practicing medicine in Yazoo City, <coughs> Mississippi in uh, 1896. The tale goes that he practiced medicine for the better part of 62, 63 years, and the apocryphal tale they tell of him is that he died within a couple of hours of having seen his last patient. 
the patient that he saw on a home visit. His son, Robert E. Fully Love Jr., my dad, graduated from Howard University's College of Medicine in 1934. He practiced medicine for 52 years, basically in the city of Newark, New Jersey. And for those of you who are New Yorkers, Jersey is that body of land on the other side of the George Washington Bridge. A lot of New Yorkers don't like to admit that they even know where Jersey is, much less have you visited it. But my dad was a urologist practicing in a city that has, since the 1930s, always reported rather high rates of sexually transmitted diseases. I'm fond of saying that uh, gonorrhea put my four brothers and me through prep school and college. And when I asked my father about the irony of being a sexually transmitted disease doc with the last name full of love, he never quite got the pun. <laughs> but at least you do. I was married for 30 years to Mindy Thompson full of love, who was a psychiatrist who graduated from Columbia Physicians and Surgeons in 1978, who's just published a book called Urban Alchemy, which is a compendium of a lot of the work that I'll be alluding to in my talk today. But having been married to a doc for 30 years, who was also a shrink so that she could look deep into my eyes and fathom my every thought, trust me when I say I know something of the culture that you're going into. But more importantly than that, I know how it has evolved. I know how it's changed. The notion that my father's most important skill was his bedside manner has little to do with the way you are going to be practicing medicine in all probability for the next couple of decades to come. And his view of sexually transmitted diseases was the view that I think was a real tension point for many folk in public health because it saw the disease as the expression of a relationship between a pathogen and the risk behaviors of the individual. When I started doing HIV research in 1986 with Andy Fullilove, the dominant theme explaining why blacks and Latinos were, even back then, overrepresented amongst the folk who were living with HIV, the notion was you had to understand something about their risk behaviors. You had to understand something about their worldview and why it is they made the choices that exposed them to the virus. And much of the research that was done under the rubric of, for example, the health beliefs theory, and much of the interventions that we put together all tried to focus on individual agents. How can I make you a conduit? How can I make you a better negotiator of sex? Noticing that and thinking that the way to understand the problem and deal with it would be to locate it in the problems of the victim and see what could be done to change the victim's approach to his life and the behavior that he or she was engaged in. Then slowly but surely, some of these started to point out, you know, we have to understand something about the cultural and physical environment that people live in, because obviously that has a lot to do not just with what they're exposed to, it has a lot to do with their own sense of agency. Those of you who will be, for example, in internal medicine and who will be dealing with the consequences of what we now term the obesity epidemic, will be in situations where you'll deal, for example, with uh, someone from Mount Haven here in the South Bronx who's grossly overweight, and the first thing you'll think of is, hey, darling, a little bit more exercise, and maybe we should start thinking about green, leafy vegetables and fruits as part of the diet. You will prescribe, for example, what, 15 minutes of walking every day. You'll give a menu of the kinds of foods you think this person should be eating. And then at some point in time when you have a, another opportunity to interact with this patient, you'll notice that perhaps things have not changed. And you'll say things like, well, what happened to the exercise that we were going to get involved with? Well, what happened with the kinds of diet that I was trying to recommend that you undertake? And then you begin to understand that, well, if she lives in Mont Haven, maybe walking every day, especially after work, is not a good idea because it's kind of dangerous out there. And maybe she lives in one of those areas that we now qualify as a food desert so that access to the kinds of vegetables and fruits that are so much a part of a good diet simply aren't available to her. You see the dilemma? We have assumed that individual agency is the one thing that we have to promote, that we have to prime up in order to have this problem resolved. But it assumes that the individual can do more than the environment will actually support. If there are no stores, or if she's got to hop in a car and drive across the George Washington Bridge to Fort Lee to get those things. Suddenly, you've added an enormous financial burden 
to the price of getting well. And it becomes clear that simply having her understand her illness and having her become more proactive in doing something about it might not be enough. In fact, it could be argued that the most important ways to help this individual wouldn't be to transform her thinking or her behavior. It might be to transform the neighborhood that she's living in, to deal with some of the structural problems that are created in areas where, because of segregation and because of poverty, access to food is difficult, and walking in the streets at night is dangerous. So much of what I've concentrated on in my work over the last 15 years has really been looking at these social determinants of health. And this is an important area in public health because if you look at Healthy People 2020, the health care goals for the United States, you will see that there are a number of items in that agenda that speak specifically to dealing with and modifying the social drivers of health and disease. And the more you start to think about what it's like to work here in the Bronx, where an understanding of those social drivers might be critical to whatever quality of care you're able to create, the first thing that I think you're likely to confront is the ways in which the neighborhoods where you work have been transformed by one important public policy, mass incarceration. I think it's important to understand that the 66 prisons here in the state of New York have a population that comes almost exclusively from the neighborhoods where you're going to do work here in New York City. 71% of the prison population in those uh, 66 prisons comes from seven neighborhoods in New York. And those seven neighborhoods happen to be the neighborhoods that have, amongst others, the highest background serial prevalence of HIV. Interesting. How did that happen? And how did it happen that the state of New York, for much of the 1990s, housed between 25 and 33 percent of all the inmates in the United States who were living with an HIV infection? Which meant that in these prisons, you had a concentration of HIV that was five to seven times what it was in the general population of the state of New York. Seems to suggest that this policy of mass incarceration the presence of these prisons, and the fact that so many New Yorkers are represented there, means that there is something going on in these neighborhoods that has a lot to do with not just the fact that they have been locked up for a crime, but also has something to do with the nature of the public health drama that's playing out in the neighborhoods that they left. So what would that look like? How would that work? How do you make a connection between somebody being locked up for a crime and the kinds of work that you do on a daily basis dealing with the folk who are residents of this neighborhood. Just before I came here, I saw a poll that had been published, I think by Gallup, that said that 20% of all white Americans know somebody who's doing time in a state or a federal prison or jail. The rate amongst African Americans was 50%. So we have sort of describing how much over the last 40 years we have slowly but surely been transforming America in ways that are often hidden and invisible, but which have had enormous impacts on poor communities, and most specifically, poor communities of color. This is a way of looking at it. In 1972, there were 200,000 men in the United States doing time in a state or a federal prison. The latest figures from 2011 suggest that that number has grown to 2.2 million. Add to that the 7.4 million folk who are on parole, on probation, or under the supervision of the courts, and that number climbs to 7.5 million. We are 5% of the world's population here in the United States. But 25% of the world's prisoners are doing time in prisons here in this country. 5% of the world's population holding 25% of all the folk who are doing time in a prison. Our rate of incarceration of our adults is greater than that of China or Russia. And the issue is, well, how did that happen? How did you go from 200,000 in 1970 to over 2.2 million at this point in the 21st century? The answer, wait for it, is the war on drugs. I've told you I'm an old man. Uh, 
Saturday, the 25th of January is my 70th birthday. Are you impressed? <laughs> that means that I bridged that era between the 1960s when everybody was smoking weed and getting high to a point when, in 1970, Richard Nixon gets up before the American people and says, drugs are public enemy number one. Very concerned not just about recreational drug use amongst college kids and students in medical school, much more concerned about trafficking in heroin and in cocaine, and especially the way in which it seemed to be driving crime in urban America. So after the declaration, the 1970s saw the creation of the Drug Enforcement Agency. The war on drugs begins. Here's how you can sort of understand that in the context of the HIV epidemic. HIV virus we discovered in 1981 when, perhaps, a bunch of folks show up with Kaposi sarcoma and a pneumocystis pneumonia in Los Angeles. They're young. They're not old. Kaposi is a cancer of old guys. How do these young folks get it? Well, there's evidence that there's a decline in the immune system, and eventually we go from declaring this grid, gay-related immunodeficiency syndrome, to ultimately saying, ah, it's AIDS. Okay, 1981 is the time when we first noticed somebody with the end stages of HIV disease, correct? If it's a virus that lays in the body as a sort of a latent presence for 10 to 15 years, isn't the real beginning of the HIV epidemic in the 1960s and the 1970s? And is it just possible that we didn't notice it amongst people who were engaged in injection drug use? Because what is more logical than to see somebody who's on the street using street drugs getting sick and dying? Look back at the records that uh, Don Desjardins and Sam Friedman put together. They suggest that in the late 1970s, we were starting to see in institutions like this large numbers of injection drug users with endocarditis. And we just assumed, yeah, you know, junkies. That's what happens. They get sick and they die. It's so much a part of their chaotic lifestyle, we didn't pay attention to it. But if you think about it, if you reflect on it, the notion that slowly but surely this virus was present, most primarily amongst folks who were injecting drugs, then it becomes evident that at the point that we made a war on drugs, we're making war on the group that was most likely in the 1970s to have been exposed to HIV. And that means that over this 10-year period, you have this circulation between the prisons and the communities where all of a sudden, we're going nuts with our efforts to ramp up our efforts to deal with this horrible crime, this crime of drug possession and use. So where does that take us? Between 1985 and the year 2000, you saw some dramatic changes in, just for example, the frequency of drug busts. Two thirds of the federal prison population in the United States today are folk who are convicted as a result of a drug-related bust. 50% of the folk doing time in state prisons throughout the United States are folk who are theirs part of a drug-related bust. There are 500,000 people doing time in a prison in the United States because of some relationship they've had with drugs. And compare that to 1980 when that figure was 41,000. 41,000 then, 500,000 now. And all of a sudden you begin to see that this explosive growth in the prison population isn't because we've done, we've done a better job catching criminals. We've basically taken folk who have been in many instances, convicted of committing a victimless crime. And we've housed our prisons with them. And I understand that this is, crudely speaking, a kind of social control. How do you deal with problems related to poverty? If poverty leads people to steal, to, 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 to commit crimes, to become engaged in violence. Well, the notion that you can lock them up and throw away the key is part of what we did in the state of New York. For those of you who uh, have memories that go back that far, this was what Governor Rockefeller was all about. So there was this notion that if we make the prison sentences hard enough, if we make it clear that if you do just a little bit of dealing, especially in an area around the school, you will pay. And the way you will pay is that you will not only be arrested and convicted, the judge will not be able to do anything. 
to modify the nature of your sense. Which means that if you're caught with a, I don't know, less, slightly less than a gram of cocaine within 500 feet of a school, you could do 25 to life. Whoa. Now, we're professionals in the areas of medicine and public health. Even back in the 1970s, while it was clear we could not cure drug addiction, we didn't know how to treat it. We did know what we could do to help people who were addicted to these substances lead relatively stable lives. If we were in the midst of a problem that made drugs public enemy number one, then perhaps a public health solution would have been to expand the nature of our treatment facilities and do the best with our science to figure out how to help people get beyond the monkeys that are on their back. But we decided instead that it was a criminal justice issue. So instead of putting it in the hands of doctors or public health professionals, we put it in the hands of the courts and the cops. And we suddenly had this explosion in the size of our prisons. And the nature of the social control that has been exercised as a result has a lot to do with the health disparities that are at the core of this talk. 40% of all the people doing time in the state or federal prison are African American. Another 22% are Hispanic. That means that two thirds of the prison population in the United States is black or brown. These are folk who are poor, largely, but not, in, not exclusively illiterate. Folk who come from neighborhoods where crime is basically the way they're going to make it in life. And as a consequence, we've suddenly seen a dramatic transformation in the neighborhoods where these folks live. Now, I, in my writings, have tried to point out that this fascination with the war on drugs and our commitment to mass incarceration is what really drove the HIV epidemic. And it did so in two ways. Number one, it created a cyclic pattern between the prisons and the community. So that for the folk who got out on lesser bids, uh, if you weren't exposed to HIV in prison as a result of your sexual activity or your drug use, and look at the surveys, you'll see that there's a lot of that going on, a lot of both of those things going on, then the likelihood would be that you got exposed in the community. And if you were released from a prison in the state of New York, you had about a 70% chance of going back within two to three years. Talk about that in a second. So all of a sudden you had this pattern between the prisons, the community, then back in the prisons. Roughly half of the 2.2 million folk who were males were doing time in state and federal prisons of folk who have already been in prison before. They're not charity, they're not new, they're not new. So not only is it a cyclic pattern, it's a cyclic pattern in which folk who've been there before go back. So what does that do to the communities that they're in? When I started doing HIV AIDS research at Columbia with Mindy, we were in Washington Heights at a time when Washington Heights was boasting the highest homicide rate in the city of Manhattan. Highest homicide rate because uh, with its presence near the George Washington Bridge, for those of you who are not from New York, Washington Heights is that area above Harlem, between 155th and say 203rd Street. And the presence of the George Washington Bridge meant that were you to walk the streets at night, two o'clock in the morning, 1990, you would see cars with drivers who had license plates coming from Virginia, D.C., Boston, all over. And they were there because they were buying cocaine. Powdered cocaine that they could later convert to crack cocaine. You take powdered cocaine, you mix it with baking soda and a little water, put it in the microwave, turn it up high, and wait till you hear the crack sound, which is where we presume the name came from. And all of a sudden, you got product. Well, with the tens of million dollars that were being made to trade in these drugs, not surprising that uh, there was a lot of cont contestation, a lot of contesting of the drug dealing territories. So Washington Heights was a place that had frequent gun duels, frequent murders, that were all basically people battling over this, this turf, which also meant that it had a huge police presence. And it's the huge police presence that impressed the most. 
Because on any given day of the week, somewhere between 25 to 35% of all the young men between the ages of 19 and 29 were in jail, in prison, on parole, or under the supervision of the courts. No men in the community. So in addition to the problems that we associate with an individual being locked up, think about what happens in poor communities of color where a significant number of the men are simply gone. Is it a big problem geographically? Oh, hell yeah. Your likelihood of being picked up wasn't just a function of your race or your ethnicity. It also was a function of the neighborhood that you were in. Here's a way of thinking about it. There's a group at Columbia that is doing work on what are called million dollar blocks. What's a million dollar block, you ask? Because we're all students, and that's what you do when you ask questions. A million dollar block is a block where the number of residents of that block who are currently doing time in a state or federal prison is so great that were you to add up the cost of their incarceration, it would exceed $1 million. That's a way of describing how much of this is environmental, how much of it is about the neighborhoods. So if the neighborhoods are the place where so many of these folks are being picked up, arrested, and sent away, what happens to the neighborhood when these guys are gone? The vacuum that has been created, I want to suggest, is exactly what made it possible for a variety of social epidemics, like drug use, to take place, to take hold, to take root, and ultimately to prosper. Here's a way of thinking about it. Harlem has typically been a community that has had a high rate of HIV infections. Uh, there are some neighborhoods in Harlem where the infection rate exceeds 2%. That means that it rivals many nations in Sub-Saharan Africa. Mount Haven, here in the South Bronx, is another one of those neighborhoods with very, very high infection rates. But I want you to think about what happens in a, in a setting and in a situation like that, where you not only have high rates of infection, you have high rates of infection because much of the drug dealing and much of the sex work that is associated with drug dealing is happening in a neighborhood that somehow or other has been transformed. What's the nature of the transformation? Look at the census for Harlem in the 1900s, say up to around 1950. 85% of the adults who lived in that community were married with children. Mindy Fully Love and I, from 1990 to 1994, did with funding from the Centers for Disease Control, something called the Harlem Household Study. It was a random, stratified sample of a thousand households in that community, which meant that it's representative of what the community really looks like. In which we asked a variety of questions about people's access to health care, their sense of their personal health, a variety of things related to things like drug use. But we also asked simple demographic information. For example, are you married? Do you have kids? 1950 census, 85 percent of the residents of Harlem who are adults are married with kids. The number we got in 1994 when we started to do the data was 16 percent. 85 percent to 16 percent. 58 percent of these adults had kids. What happened to the kids? Where are they? What are they doing? Well, one of the things that was happening in the 80s and 90s is the kids were the ones who were dealing with drugs. This used to be sort of common knowledge, but because the crack cocaine era is basically around the time many of you were in grammar school. Let me just say that the, the, the evil genius of the drug dealer was simple. Uh, if you hired an adult to be out in the street selling your product, the likelihood that he or she would be picked up by the cops was almost 100%. You expect that. It's part of the cost of doing business. But if an adult is picked up by the cops and goes to Rikers, hey, you might not see him for six to eight months. And then if he does a bit upstate, maybe never. However, if you hire a juvenile, someone under the age of 16, they are released within 24 hours, typically in the custody of an adult. A parent, a guardian, somebody. Which means that if you're running a business that requires that you have your salespeople out in the streets, the best way to keep your sales force out of the joint was to have the composed of folk who were adolescents or in their early teens. What happens to a community that is family oriented so that within the space of one generation it is transformed into an open air drug result? 
I'm going to suggest that what has occurred is that the men are gone. This isn't sexism. This is all about the dynamics of family life. It takes two adults to raise a child. Try being a single parent. Any single parents in the audience? Bless your hearts. I was a single parent for 11 years. That's why my hair is gray. Nothing to do with work. We expect that in any community, the most important task for adults is to usher young people into the lives that they will lead as citizens of their community, as folks who are contributing to its well-being, folks who are creating the possibility for collective efficacy. What happens when one of the adults who's supposed to teach young men what it means to be a man is no longer there? What you have, I would suggest, is chaos. And what you have is a lack of eyes on the street. There are no longer folk looking out on the block to see whether or not anybody's doing something they shouldn't do. And the supervision that would normally be given young people has disappeared. It exists in a vacuum. 16% are married. Oh my goodness. 58% have kids. If you are interested in pediatrics and you are dealing with young people in this community, see the degree to which the families that you are dealing with, in quotation marks, aren't blood relatives. They're an auntie. They're somebody who's from the extended family network. They have responsibility for the child, but it is not the same as being a mom, and it is not the same as being a dad. And I want to suggest that the biggest damage that the war on drugs did, and this policy of mass incarceration, was so decimate the life of the community by taking so many men away, that the social structures that are so absolutely essential for raising young people into adult life simply disappear. And in the chaos that ensues, of course you would have widespread drug dealing and the perfect ecological niche for a virus like HIV. And I'm just saying it's not just that the men are missing. When they come back, they are no longer citizens of the United States. They belong to some murky underclass because conviction of a felony in the United States means you have given up your rights as a citizen. Now, in the state of New York, you can, you can uh, basically petition the courts after you've done parole to get your right to vote back. And many of the rights that we take for granted will also be present for you as well. But there are seven states in the United States where one out of every four black men has permanently lost the right to vote because he's carrying a felony conviction. Some of you I know have probably read Michelle Alexander's absolutely excellent book, um, the New Jim Crow. The thesis of the book is simple, that we are no longer dealing with segregated America or the racism that was so much a part of the 1900s, but we are dealing with something that's much more insidious, with one out of every three black men in the United States likely to do at least one year in prison or jail in his or her lifetime. We are rapidly creating an underclass that has no place in our modern post-industrial society. They have no place because they're not citizens. They can't vote. But understand that in the city of New York, meaning to do whatever we could for the folk who live in public housing projects or who are housed because of Section 8 vouchers, if you are someone who has been convicted of a drug-related crime, you don't have access to that housing. You don't have access to Section 8 housing. And in many housing projects, they will not even look at your petition worse. If your family takes you back in, they risk being evicted as well. So what has that done to life in the community? 70% of all African American children born in the United States will be born into a single-headed household. There are 24 million children in the United States who are living in a home where their father is not present. One in every four white children is forced to deal with this reality. One in every three Hispanic children is forced to deal with this reality. Two of every three black children deals with this reality. Growing up in a home, not only where dad is missing, your dad has been convicted of a crime. Your dad is a felon. Your dad is, use whatever pejorative term you wish. That's who your dad is. So what does that mean for you in your life? 
likely that you won't graduate from high school. Your academic achievement will not be as significant as that of your classmates. The likelihood that you too will be brought up, that you'll be caught up in the criminal justice system, goes up exponentially. So one of the issues that we associate with being a convicted felon is, not only do you not have access to housing, you don't have access in many instances to your family. One woman in her right mind would say, okay, baby, I'm so glad to see you home. I will risk homelessness for me and the kids just to have you back in my bed. I think a lot of folks make the rational choice to say, well, you know, how about I catch you on the weekends? How is this significant for what you do in the course of uh, your time in the clinical rotation here in the Bronx? 50 to 55% of all the homeless men that you'll see in this community and throughout New York are folk who have, amongst others, a criminal justice history. Either they've been locked up for a crime or because we close our mental health facilities. These are folk who are dealing with a mental health diagnosis. For whom the only real place when they're acting up was Rikers Island. Or one of the facilities where we deal with the criminally insane. But the fact still remains that what we're dealing with is a population that is at extreme risk for homelessness. And because of their homelessness, they are likely to be involved in a variety of behaviors that will also expose them to HIV. Then there's the biggest problem of all, education. You all are ass over T. Kevin and Deck just to be here, right? <laughs> Anybody who didn't laugh, could we talk after the class? <laughs> I got a business proposition. I have a bridge over this study. <laughs> You're a convicted felon in most states. You don't qualify for federal or state loans for education. If 61% of the folk we lock up are folk who didn't finish high school, or who are functionally illiterate. What crazier policy could we have than to make it clear that once you've been caught up in this system, you will never be able to educate your way out of it. Because whatever price has to be paid to further your education, you can't afford it. Think about it. This is, this is the nature of the madness that has created chaotic communities where parents, and children are not necessarily living in the same realities. Where, for example, the absence of so many men not only has affected family life, not only has affected the economic enterprises that normally would occur in poor communities, it's also influenced things like the marriage market. Sandy Lane at the State University of New York, Syracuse, did a study looking at communities where the ratio of women to men exceeds two to one. In places like this, the ways in which men and women relate to each other will change in many dramatic ways. Not only will the men be beasts and jerks because they have the run of the mill, it will also become clear that uh, women themselves will change much of their behavior in order to make sure, especially in a culture where having a man is highly valued, they'll change their behaviors to make sure that they have access to a man, which in many instances means that you want to have sex, you do not have to use a condom. And if we're talking about neighborhoods in New York City, which already have a high background HIV serial prevalence rate, what could be crazier than deciding that it's in your best interest to have unprotected sex if that's a way of keeping a man? And I talk to women in this situation, in drug treatment programs, and I'll say, look, doc, if I, if I understand you correctly, you're worried about my choices because you tell me I might be exposed to a virus that's gonna kill me in about 15 years. I got that right, Doc? 15 years? Okay, what am I going to do tonight? I need a man tonight. 15 years is an abstraction. It will take care of itself. Right now, this is a rational thing for me to do. And Carol will come up with a cure, won't you? I want to suggest that in this kind of uh, setting, where I focus a lot on HIV, almost everything having to do with the ways in which physicians interact with patients will be effective. You count on patients going back to a family. You're dealing with a male who uh, didn't want to be in the doctor's office in the first place. I bet in 30 to 40 percent of the cases that person is there because his wife, his girlfriend, some woman in his life said, I'm going to get in. Can I get in again for those of you who've seen this? If it's important that folk be consistent and adherent to whatever drug treatment regimens you put them under, then it's often the family that provides the support to make sure that that happens. 
in a setting where there is social chaos of the type I've described, where the glue, the social capital that holds people together is severely strained, threatened, or non-existent, then your job becomes that much harder. Part of what makes medical and public health interventions work is they're being placed in communities where folk, in principle, will be neighborly towards one another and will pull together to solve the problems that are created by, for example, a massive, deadly, infectious disease epidemic like HIV. So why didn't the family-oriented communities of the 1950s stamp out HIV at the point when it started? Because by the time we noticed it, we'd already been dealing with so many years of the war on drugs, so many men were missing from the community, that the evolution that occurred not only was a nightmare for those of us who were doing that kind of infectious disease control, for anybody who was caring about the health status of these communities, there was a challenge. So, what is there out there for us to do? Presumably this is not just to scare you to death with how creepy it is beyond these walls, it's because there's got to be something that can be done that can alter the nature of these rather dismal statistics. Let me suggest that the most important link in this chain is the one that's provided by education. Now a lot of people, when I give this talk, especially in uh, general audiences. People say, wait, 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 wait. let's get deep here. You want to work with these criminals? You know, I was mugged once. Or I was a victim of a robbery. The last thing I want to do is see somebody doing something for people who are guilty of creating that kind of abuse, who are guilty of doing that to me. And there is a sense that in America, we don't like criminals. We hate them. Aren't our best TV shows hot? and robbery shows where the evil are caught and punished. That's what our system of uh, mass incarceration is about, isn't it? We're not trying to rehabilitate folk. We're trying to punish them. So it means almost everything on the inside is completely stripped away. And instead of prison, as it is in the case in many Scandinavian countries, a place where someone will be educated, rehabilitated, and reintegrated into community life. No, we're creating folk who have no place to go, nothing to do, except within three years of being out, commit another crime so they go right back in. So, why should you be concerned about it? Well, let's think about it this way. It costs $30,000 a year to keep one man locked up for a year. Multiply that times 2.2 million, and all of a sudden you see why a lot of states a lot of conservatives, like Ross Nimble, are saying, yeah, maybe the whole war on drugs thing is a bad idea. Maybe, maybe the whole criminal justice solution to the problem isn't a solution. Because you may know that the number of people that we have in jail or prison has very little impact on crime rates. They do seem to function independently. So one of the reasons that people should think about reorienting their notions about what to do to solve the problems of inner city communities where crime is rampant is to do something else that doesn't cost you, the taxpayer, $30,000 a year per inmate. In the end, that not only influences what happens to your taxes, it has everything to do in the state of New York with your access to an institution like this. Somewhere in 1978, the legislature here in New York decided that they were going to start cutting spending to higher education specifically to the City University of New York and to the State University of New York in order to finance the expansion of prison facilities. Interesting shift in the economy of this state. At that point in time, you, the taxpayer, you, the student, start to bear more of a burden for your higher education. The reasoning being it's an investment in your future, borrow some money, go into poverty because ultimately you will get out. But the truth of the matter is, in the 1970s, the SUNY system used to be stellar. It used to be stellar. Now, like most state education systems, it is hugely underfunded. And if you look at the correlation between spending on prisons and prison construction and spending on higher education, you will see that there is an almost perfect negative correlation. As one goes up, the other goes down. But let's think about healthcare, too. <clears throat> Folk who are caught up in this system are the ones who are most likely to use the 
emergency department as their primary care physician. You all must be talking about that constantly. So you know that one of the other issues that is created is that when someone has been convicted of a felony, their access to social services up to and including health care can be severely and seriously challenged. And if we're spending a lot of money on emergency departments instead of on a public health solution to set of solutions to our chronic disease crisis, the fact that so much of what's driving the action in an emergency department is created in communities where the men are missing and where a lot of the illnesses that people are confronting and are exposed to are literally the result of the social chaos in which they live, it becomes less an issue of whether you like or approve of working with criminals and much more an issue of is this the best way to solve the problems we have in this country with dealing with the issues, the crises, and the problems that are associated with poverty. So I keep coming back to education. <clears throat> Every Monday now for the last uh, six semesters, I get up at uh, 5.30 in the morning and I drive two hours to Woodbourne State Correctional Facility. Woodbourne is uh, one of the medium security prisons that houses the Bard College Prison Initiative. Fascinating. It's not a part of Columbia, so I can talk about them without conflict of interest. For the last 13 years, Bard College, this lovely little private little liberal arts college on the Hudson somewhere, has been sponsoring AA and BA degree programs in six state prisons in the general area of uh, Woodward, that is to say, Ulster County and Sullivan County. I am teaching a course, a series of courses on public health. I am teaching these courses to folk we're not like the 61% I alluded to earlier. These are folk who could be and should have been seating where you're sitting where you're seated now. These are honest to God college students. They've passed entrance exams, they've had interviews, they've done writing samples. They are real students. And the notion is that if they can be awarded a BA or an AA degree while they're on the inside, the likelihood that they'll be part of the recidivism, recidivism statistics that I, cite, that I cited earlier vanishes, goes from 70% to less than 10%. And the idea is that with the students, I suddenly, for the first time, I've been teaching since 1964. I'm yeah, coming up on 50 years of doing this stuff. All of a sudden, when I walk into a class after having assigned all kinds of readings, they've read the stuff. <laughs> not only have they read the stuff, they're not respectful, adoring. It was like, no, doc, 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 wait, 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 on page 30, what the hell is that? Talk to me about this. I mean, it's the first time I've really experienced education where I think it's supposed to, where I think it's really supposed to go down. All of a sudden, you are opening up a new world of folk. Whatever is in the past is definitely in the past, but it becomes very, very clear that for a lot of people, what they didn't do as young people, and in many instances, they got caught up in something stupid, stupid and found themselves doing 25 to 30 year bids, they're suddenly seeing the possibilities for what can only be described as a kind of a rebirth. My notion is that if we ever figure out how to get the kinks out of the Affordable Care Act, these are the folk who will come back to you here in the Bronx talking about how to recruit folk in neighborhoods who are currently living without health insurance to become part of the folk, to become part of the enrollments. And why would I have them do it as opposed to you guys? Well, we can't afford you, number one. But number two, for a lot of the, quote, hard to reach populations that these people are a part of, getting to that population, walking the walk and talking the talk, is what I think will ultimately really make everything that was envisioned in the Affordable Care Act real. These are guys who are really clear when they get out, they are willing to do whatever is necessary to build up communities that they, at least in part, were responsible tearing down. They're motivated, they're ready, and it seems to me that in general, the education to prison pipeline is the one area where all of us has an opportunity to have an impact. All of us. Because if anything has transformed American life in this economy, it has been our ability to provide universal access to educational opportunity. That we have denied that opportunity to a group that will, for all intents and purposes, always be on the sideline unless something concrete is done. 
means that this might be a solution, an idea whose time has come. So, Bard is just one of many colleges, there are a couple that are in the CUNY system, which are now saying more and more, if we're gonna be about the business of education, if we're gonna be about the business of being institutions that really do community service, then we have to think about what's gonna occur over the next 10 years when more and more states will be releasing their nonviolent offenders back into the community, saying we can't afford to house you anymore, find something. Well, the hope is that what they find would be some version of what you are in a unique position to provide. And I don't mean working with folk who were formerly incarcerated. I'm talking about working with folk who are at risk of being caught up in that system. At some point in time, typically around the third, fourth, or fifth grade, young men in particular are going to make a decision about whether or not their social identities are going to be bound up in school, whether they're going to be bound up in some version of an academic life that you all have embraced and made your own. If they say, uh-uh, this is not for me, there isn't much out there that's going to help bring them back into the mainstream. So any intervention that involves having docs in schools, something that the Department of Health here and the Board of Education are all interested in doing, means that all of a sudden, at a critical point in someone's education, they get to see you. They get to see what you're about. Not an old phobia like me, but someone who can say, been there, done that, took a different path, and you can too. I'm not selling a particular program. I don't have a well-formed intervention. But what I have learned, having been in a family of docs for the better part of seven decades, is that almost all of the real creativity that resides in this country is not in engineers, it's in you guys. Who else takes somebody who says, ah, no, I don't feel good, and comes up with a differential diagnosis? If that isn't creativity, what is? If you can solve that problem, is it so far-fetched to imagine that if what's driving health disparities is the problem created by our prison industrial complex, is it too much to imagine that maybe some of the solutions lie in the nature of the interactions you will have as physicians with the communities that are so heavily impacted by that set of public policies? My notion of a solution comes about literally in thinking that if we were able to extend the quality of educational opportunity, if we're able to expand the number of people who could take advantage of it. It would not only benefit the economy, it would produce a drastic change in the nature of medicine and public health in these affected communities. And you know, you probably guessed that somewhere in my background I got training as a preacher. It sounds more like a sermon than a lecture, does it not? <laughs> Mea culpa. Mea maxima culpa. Well, the black church, they have this saying, if not us, who? And if not now, when? Good question for 2014. Thank you. So that was supposed to be provocative. I saw a couple of you go up there. <laughs> Questions, comments? Before you eat, they, they tell me they're not going to feed you until. <laughs> the prison policy responding to the HIV transmission piece of the cycle that you talked about? Uh, pace. Let me be clear, New York State is, as far as I can see, really out of band in, in any one of a dozen different ways. Prisoners concerned about AIDS education, AIDS, TAC, uh, whatever. They have a program that is sponsored by inmates that is present in maybe half of the current um, minimum, I mean, medium and maximum security facilities where, where inmates, prisoners, are trained how to do HIV risk assessments, how to do the reading of HIV tests. They're about counseling and education, and that's the city, counseling and education. Prisoners about AIDS counseling and education. And I did the World AIDS Day presentation at Green Haven Prison, which is up in Ulster County. It's one of the scariest places you ever want to be in life. And I gave a talk about the HIV AIDS epidemic in Black and Latino America to about 150 prisoners. And it was very, very well received. And they had extraordinarily good questions about cure, 
about vaccines, about risk behavior, da 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 da. I mean, part of what they've done is understood that an occupied inmate is a safe inmate. One of the big things that governs what happens in a prison is the superintendent is just concerned about safety. He doesn't want anybody getting hurt because you've got a lot of dangerous individuals locked up. And you want to make sure that whatever else is going on, the conditions of their confinement don't meet the problems. Well, it turns out that when you have almost any kind of educational activity, it is a way of directing the energies of both intellectual energies and otherwise. And it does create a kind of a calm in the population that uh, they have seen is of great benefit to them. So they are pushing these programs. It doesn't cost them any money. They bring in somebody like me to give a talk of the type that I gave. People are inspired to learn more about what they can do, both there and in the communities to which they'll return. And I think in the end, as more and more systems of incarceration in states throughout the US pick up on this model, you start to see a pretty important change in what's happening. But the biggest thing that the prisons are doing in a lot of states is just simply letting people go. And that is the real problem. Because what we're seeing is that somebody who was treated for HIV while they're on the inside has probably got the best quality of medical care we're able to offer in the United States. I mean, after all, it's directly their therapy, isn't it? I can tell whether or not you're taking the meds. And I can see dramatic drops in viral loads and what have you. It's when you get on the outside and you've got to connect to a provider. You've got to connect to housing and to whatever other social support you're going to need to pay for this new life. That's when things start to fall apart. And a number of studies recently have pointed out that the delay between picking up on a set of antiretrovirals for which you have a prescription at the point that you're released, the delay can be as much as six months. And if you know anything about HIV and its mutating characteristics, you understand that in six months, you have mutated that virus into all kinds of variants that we won't be able to check. So while we're really clear that things are getting much better in many states on the inside, it's what happens in that connection between the prison and the community where things at the moment are sort of falling apart. And they're not falling apart because people are being evil about it. It's because they're two separate bureaucratic systems. And the fact that they've never had to work together means that they're really unprepared for the challenges that they're facing today, especially when those challenges are complicated by the fact that nobody has any money. How many times have you heard people cry poor boy? Oh, we can't do that. We ran out of money. There's no funding. Is that, do you, do you all not get that? If you don't get that, I'm coming here tomorrow. <laughs> that's all I hear. Oh, no, Dr. Bob, I'm so sorry. No, no, no. We had a grant for that, but no. Uh, go on. So, I mean, at a point when you're starting to see real changes in many, many different ways, uh, in many different aspects that deal with fighting the epidemic, we're at a point where everybody's running out of money and the way to finance our way from where we are now to where we should be in the future. That's what's sort of been in jeopardy, and it's one of the things that I worry about most. But I give you the upbeat talk. I come back and I do the fire and brimstone. I have you all scared to death. I'm ready to get out of medicine, join the military. You know. <laughs> I mean, don't you sometimes worry about what will happen if X, Y, and Z doesn't occur? Well, you know, once you become engaged in academic medicine, they will pay you to think about and develop the worst case scenario, which means that you don't have any sleep at night. But, but, but that's neither here nor there. At this moment, when you're still looking forward to the day when you're done, <laughs> I'm with you. Yes? Um, what would, do you have any um, ideas about what the best way to address substance abuse and drug use instead of incarceration? I know a lot of countries especially that have nationalized health care. Yeah, like Portugal, for example. Yeah, I mean, uh, are we in the midst of that debate right now? I was in Colorado, so was he, before they legalized it. So I'm actually sober as it speaks. But I do believe that with all the people who are traveling to Colorado now, you know, whether you buy it and use it there without getting busted, means that, I mean, as far as I can see, the door has been open. I have no idea how they're going to close it. That means that we're about to go through a variety of uh, interesting debates about whether or not making illicit substances available won't change much of the pattern that I just described. If you don't have to have a criminal empire in order to make this stuff available, what would that do to all of the incentives that are out there to have people get into that life because it's a way of making money? I think if you take away the, in a capitalist economy like ours, if you take away the 
economic motive, I think a lot of the problem starts to disappear. And isn't that what they've seen in places like England, where when they legalized uh, access to heroin, all of a sudden you had a plateau of the number of new heroin users. I mean, if you've ever been in any of the debates that people have had about syringe exchange programs, uh, it used to be where people were so worried that if you made needles available free, then everybody would start to use a drug. It's like, oh my gosh, look, here's a clean syringe. Quick, let's find some heroin. <laughs> As you know, it doesn't work like that. My sense is that you're going to get a lot of people, medical users of marijuana, are going to say, hey, look, I'm sorry. You can't cut this off. And then when it becomes clear that you can tax this stuff and make a fortune, states that are screaming because they're really unable to balance their budgets, they're going to say, well, you know, maybe there's a little weed on the side. <laughs> <laughs> Those are the scenarios that I really enjoy, but I think that's going to change the nature of the debate. And I think we're going to be focused on what we really should be worrying about, which is the abuse of prescription drugs. I mean, you know, I think we're, we're seeing so many complications that arise when people cannot stop using Oxycontin and what have you, that, you know, that, that I think is where the real problem is. But that's, again, my optimistic outlook, that once the door is open and once the debates begin, there are going to be so many people who are going to come out of the closet and say, you know, I used to do this stuff. I think it's time to be legalized. And then all of a sudden, you're going to see a sea change, not just in the patterns of use and abuse, but you're also going to see changes in the criminal justice engagement of all this, which I think would ultimately be the case. You've been attending. Uh, bon appétit. Yeah. <laughs> well, on behalf of the Social Medicine Course, thank you so much, everyone, for listening. And thank you, Bob, for giving a great talk. I'd also like to thank the other lead organizers, Becca Mon, Sarah Ruberman, Kyle Whelan, as well as our faculty advisor, Matt Anderson, and Marty Grayson, Albert Cooperman, and Martin Penn for all their help. We plan to post many more lectures, so subscribe to us and check out socialmedicine.org. Thank you all once again for listening, and always remember, imagination is more important than knowledge. Peace.